I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series, Telehealth for Vulnerable Populations. As the COVID-19 pandemic spreads across the world, now only 400,000, there are now over 400,000 deaths worldwide and over 110,000 deaths in our country alone. And we're noting the disproportionate impact it has on communities of color who are also experiencing egregious discrimination. On a positive note, telehealth has become a vehicle that expands access to physical and mental health for vulnerable populations. Our goal with this series of webinars is to share best practices and lessons learned so that we can not only expand access to vulnerable populations, but also improve the quality so that it's not only evidence-based, but also culturally relevant, effective, and empowering. To that end, the University of Memphis is hosting a series of six one-hour webinars in the month of June related to telehealth for vulnerable populations. Our topic today is telehealth and school-based programming, and our moderator is Dr. Susan Ellswick. With over 500 attendees and a waiting list of 370 people, this is clearly a topic of great value and interest. I'd like to thank the FedEx Institute, and in particular, Dr. Jasbir Dhaliwal for hosting this webinar series. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Rudd, president of the University of Memphis, who has graciously offered to welcome you. Dr. Rudd. Uh, thank you, Marianne. And let me say thank you to Susan for uh, moderating this uh, as well and in offering this series. Um, I don't know if, if, you're, uh, if those that have joined us are aware, but I'm actually a clinical psychologist by training uh, and practiced for about 15 years before coming back into higher education. Uh, so I'm keenly aware of the need uh, for telehealth services. Uh, and, uh, and I'm really grateful for everyone joining us uh, to review best practices and how to have an impact at such a difficult time. So let me say welcome, uh, and let me say thank you for dedicating time and energy and effort on such an important topic. I don't know that there's ever been a more critical time uh, around telehealth. And hopefully this will be a helpful conversation and a helpful process for all of those providers uh, that are engaged. And I look forward to participating as well, uh, learning and being a part of this process. So Marion, thank you. Susan, thank you for your efforts. Uh, and to all of those that have joined us today, thank you for being involved, being active, uh, and for helping our community. Thank you, President Rudd. Susan, we'll take it, give it to you. Okay. Um, again, thank you guys for joining. We appreciate you being here. As you enter the webinar, we're actually gonna place you on mute. Uh, there is a question and answer box. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please put your questions in that box and we will be responding throughout the presentation and we will offer an opportunity uh, to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Um, also, please attempt to direct your questions directly to which presenter you would like to ask uh, the question of so that we can kind of make sure we're tailoring the answer back to you appropriately. This session is being recorded and that recording will be placed on our website at the University of Memphis underneath the telehealth and webinar section. We are also posting that link in the chat box for those of you that are interested in viewing the recording at a later date. We also wanna thank the American Council for School Social Work for their support in today's presentation. Uh, the University of Southern California, we're so glad to have uh, on with us today. We'd also like to thank the Tennessee National Association of Social Works West Branch. They will be providing our NASW CEUs for social workers today and all of the other affiliates that we have that have assisted us in these webinars. Um, also, at the very end of today's presentation, you will later receive a link in an email uh, for a survey to complete. In order to get your CEUs, you must complete that survey. And then we also will post the, the materials that we discussed today in today's webinar, as well as the recording on that telehealth website that's linked in in the chat box. So today's learning objectives, we're going to look at and try to understand the need and purpose for telehealth in today's school-based programming. Uh, 
We're also going to provide some support around best practices and providing supports and really understanding that as mental health practitioners in schools, we need to be advocates for telehealth programming, especially in times like these to ensure that service delivery continues for students and vulnerable populations that are served in schools. And we're also going to talk about some techniques that can assist with engaging students in practice. Um, and later on, we're going to hear about University of Southern California's specific program using telesuites uh, and providing service delivery to schools in their district. So I am Dr. Ellswick. I'm an associate professor at the University of Memphis in the School of Social Work. I um, have over 16 years of clinical experience. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi, and I'm a licensed school social worker here in the state of Tennessee. I'm going to let Sarah introduce herself. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, allowing me to present my um, program to you today. I am Sarah Caliboso Soto. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in um, Southern California. I'm also an assistant professor in field education at the USC Suzanne Dwork Peck School of Social Work. Um, I am also um, the clinical director of our telehealth clinic based out in Los Angeles. And today I will be sharing with you our Telesuite program at Telehealth. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. We're glad to have you today. So when we start thinking about why would we want to do telehealth in schools, first we need to understand what is telehealth. Uh, and that is a broad term that's used frequently across different programs. And so we just want to kind of clarify that telehealth is just providing service delivery uh, to clients that we would typically provide in a face to face format through some form of technology. Um, usually the provider is a therapist licensed and trained and each state has their own regulations around who can and cannot provide telehealth services. I will say because of COVID-19, a lot of those restrictions have been lifted and many of us have access across the nation to provide these services. But as we move out of the pandemic, some of those may change. So make sure you're checking with your specific state uh, and local authorities about who can and can't provide those services. But those services can be provided as long as you have a web camera, a microphone, speakers, you can use any of the following uh, formats. You can use a desk or laptop, an iPad, um, an iPhone or smartphone, and that allows the client the ability to have service delivery provided to them in their home environment. Many of us in school-based practice were thrown into telehealth programming because of COVID-19. Um, and so we really are trying to navigate best practices for students. So currently the way that we're providing telehealth in many of the school districts around the nation is the student is in their home environment and we are in a clinic or an office space providing that same level of mental health service delivery that we would have provided to them face to face in the school setting if we were still in sessions. Uh, some things to kind of think about our confidentiality. Uh, we need to make sure to help parents understand in the home environment how to set up a space that is confidential, uh, that is secure, where the child can continue to do therapeutic practice in a confidential way. Um, I personally have had to have a couple of conversations with parents about what might be an appropriate place in your home to set this up. You know, you may want the child to go into a separate room to be able to close the door. Um, and so really talking about those confidentiality pieces with the caregivers in the child's life uh, and also with the child directly because uh, they can move to another room and close a door if that's more secure for them. So confidentiality is something that we definitely think about as we move into the next academic year. It's also important for us to start, start thinking about including um, information about informed consent and including telehealth as part of your in informed consent process. We don't know if we will need to continue to use telehealth in the future. Um, I'm assuming that this is going to stay around for a very long period of time. So this is just the beginning of telehealth programming in schools. So as you're moving into the next academic year, really thinking about informed consent and ensuring that you're embedding that telehealth piece into it in case that is necessary and needed. So it is a virtual outpatient behavioral mental health clinic that provides service delivery to really we want to focus on mild to moderate um, psychosocial problems and uh, identified disorders. There are certain diagnoses that we would probably want to avoid utilizing telehealth uh, in severe mental illness uh, for case psychosis could be problematic in a telehealth format. Um, but the majority of the service delivery that we provide in schools can easily be formatted in a telehealth uh, program. 
um, schools identify the need of the child. So schools could still do referrals at this point in time. It doesn't mean that if we were seeing a kid at the beginning of the semester and now school has ended, that we would not continue to accept referrals for those children. And we'll talk more a little bit about why we want to continue service delivery um, and we'll probably need to offer service delivery to more children in the future because of the current pandemic that we're under. So why telehealth for school-based practice? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, when we start looking at the statistics of mental health and, and diagnosed disorders in our country, uh, about 6.1 million children are diagnosed with ADHD. So as a school-based practitioner, we understand how ADHD can impact the child's ability to function in the school environment. They struggle with uh, the inability to sit still, oftentimes have talk out behavior, a lot of externalizing behaviors that can be disruptive in the classroom. They have difficulty completing tasks. Um, they may be extremely impulsive, which impairs their social abilities, which oftentimes will negatively impact their academic functioning. Um, so with this large of a number of children with ADHD, mental health service delivery is definitely needed. Uh, 4.5 million children are identified with some type of behavioral disorder or behavioral problem. 4.4 million have some form of an anxiety disorder and 1.9 million have been diagnosed with depression. As we start thinking about those statistics, we want to also look at how much treatment are these children able to access. What we know in school-based practice is one of the benefits and beauties of school-based programming is that we're able to break down a lot of the barriers to service delivery uh, so children can access needed services within the school day. So when we look at depression, about 78.1% of students that are diagnosed with depression ages 3 to 17 actually get service delivery. So there's still a gap in services being provided. If those children are getting a referral out to a community provider, oftentimes they don't get to that provider to get the services that are, are required or needed. So providing it within the school setting breaks down a lot of those barriers to transportation or financial strains that the parent may have or just being able to embed one more thing into their daily schedule to get their child to that, to that needed appointment. 59.3% um, of children with anxiety disorders receive some form of support so that still half of the students in the nation are not receiving services for anxiety and similarly with behavior disorders. We also understand that one in six children ages two through eight are diagnosed with some form of a mental health or behavioral health disorder. And if we can catch those needs earlier in our pre-K programs and early intervention programs, we're able to address those needs to prevent it from escalating to the point where the child's not performing well academically or behaviorally in the school setting. So early intervention also is a big key part to school-based practice. And during times like COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're currently in, public schools need to realize that just because schools have stopped serving children face-to-face, -face, it does not mean that the service deliveries we were providing them end. So we have to think about that free appropriate public education. If the child was receiving behavioral and mental health services through the school before the pandemic, those services need to continue throughout their education. So when the pandemic hit, a lot of schools were struggling with what do we even do for academics? How do we even continue academic needs for children? And sometimes the mental and behavioral health piece gets forgotten. But when we think about that as behavioral and mental health clinicians, we have to be advocates for our students and we have to help schools understand that there are other options. Even though we can't do face-to-face, -face, telehealth is an option that we can provide students to continue those needed mental, mental health uh, service deliveries. We also have to make sure though that we're providing those services in a culturally responsive way and that we're also making sure that there's access and equitable programming for all students. Now that is a large struggle across the nation currently, making sure that all students have access to technology or have access to supportive services so telehealth can, can continue to be provided. One of the other things that we would also suggest in your next upcoming academic year is to think about surveying your parents and your families about what access to technology do they currently have. We're going to provide a survey sample that you can use as part of your enrollment packet if you choose to do so in the next academic year. It's uh, developed by Common Sense Media 
and it is just a simple survey that asks the questions, do you have access to internet, iPhone, laptop? That way each school will have an understanding of the need, the technology and infrastructure need within their school district so that they can adequately provide that support to the students. That way service delivery is never interrupted, not the academic service delivery and not the behavioral and mental health service delivery. Now we also talked about our students and our nation are going through a lot right now. Two large pandemics are occurring simultaneously. And as mental health practitioners, we need to be prepared for trauma-informed service delivery, whether that's face-to-face -face in our schools or providing a hybrid where it's face-to-face -face and telehealth-based, but we're going to have a larger need when we return to school. Um, and we know that many of us are in mental health shortage regions here in the Memphis area. We are a mental health shortage region. And so telehealth is going to assist us with being able to serve the needs of the larger population as we start to address and look at the trauma that many of our families and our parents and our students are going to bring to the table when we come back into session in August. Um, so when we think about how to do best practice, there are a set of NASW standards of practice for use in technology. So we will also link that for you to review, but it helps us to understand things like confidentiality and how to ensure that you're providing an informed consent and how do you use technology for good within the field of mental health. So there are a set of standards for social workers that already exist. Um, and it could easily be adapted to other professions. But we as practitioners have to ensure that the technology that we're using, we're utilizing to enhance outcomes for children and families, and we're using that technology for good. So just keep in your mind that as we're moving through these uh, new changes in school-based practice, telehealth is an option. And many of us were thrown into that, but now that we have a good grounding on what the expectation is, what are the standards of practice, what should we be providing to schools, to students, um, and even to teachers at this point, because teachers are really struggling too. There's a large level of trauma that our teachers are experiencing trying to navigate this new form of, of education as well. So when we think about globally, the statistics on telehealth in schools, this isn't a new thing. Telehealth programming in schools has existed for quite some time. Typically school-based health clinics are the ones utilizing telehealth programs or hospital settings. We also see large universities are also supporting that telehealth work within the community. And they oftentimes will utilize uh, mental health programming. So it's uh, therapeutic intervention for children and adolescents and even adults. Um, and then they also can provide what we call telemedicine. So if the child needed psychiatric supports, that's even an option being provided through some of the school-based health clinics within the nation. We've seen an increase. Um, only 7% of schools were actually utilizing some form of telehealth uh, within their school-based health clinic. But in the 2016-2017 survey that was conducted, 19% of schools were utilizing it. So that was a pretty big jump. Um, in, in a small span of time. We know that about 1 million students, uh, about 1,800 public schools are currently using a school-based health clinic model. Many of those are providing service delivery to rural communities, and those services are being provided by local hospitals in the region or university programs. So there is a large opportunity for us as mental health practitioners to continue to use telehealth in practice. And I kind of talked to you about how we utilize it with the student being in the home environment and you're in the clinic providing the service delivery. But we're gonna talk about how do you set up a telesuite in a school to provide those service deliveries to students as well. So telehealth is a growing trend. Um, as I just noted in the data, it's really kind of uh, gained some traction over the last few years. It's just as effective as face-to-face -face treatment. There are a number of research um, articles showing that that treatment continues to be just as effective as face-to-face. -face. It improves access to service delivery for a large number of individuals who can't access mental health services in their communities. And it also removes those barriers to practice. So it decreases the need for the individual to be transported from one location to another. It actually decreases um, the cost uh, 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 usually that is required by an individual to pay for gas to get back and forth or uh, to get a taxi back and forth. So it does break down those service delivery or barriers and it also has less of a stigma uh, than actually having a clinician come in and see you face to face. 
one of the other things that I would mention as we've moved through the pandemic and I'm being a, a, a provider of mental health direct service delivery and have used telehealth, I actually get a better picture of what our parents are going through and what the displayed behaviors are in the home environment by doing telehealth. So I may not ever see that behavior in my office when the child comes in, even at the school level, if they come in to see me for group or individual therapy, I may not see that same behavior because it's a different context, a different environment. Um, and so being able to see what a parent tells you that they see in the home environment is pretty powerful too. Um, so there's been a lot of benefits to providing that telehealth in the home environment as well. So you may be thinking what kind of approved platforms can you use? What telehealth platforms are appropriate? Uh, there, this is a list, uh, it's not an exhaustive list, there are many more, of HIPAA compliant uh, programs that can be utilized to initiate your telehealth program in a school setting. Many people um, use the DoxyMe, uh, a lot of Zoom is being used, which is great. Just make sure you're following the protocol to ensure safety uh, around your Zoom sessions. VC is another one that's quite frequently used in telehealth and mental health programming. But you can decide as a clinician and as a school district, what which of these you decide might be most appropriate for, for you to use. But these um, have been approved and HIPAA compliance uh, has been indicated. So that kind of takes a little bit of the guesswork out of where to start. Different client needs that we typically serve in telehealth. As we mentioned, we, there are certain diagnoses that we probably would not want to use telehealth model for, um, schizophrenia being one of those or severe mental illness. But personal life crisis, grief, depression, uh, trauma-based service delivery can be adapted for telehealth programming, substance abuse, uh, homework-related issues and stressors, and then behavioral challenges. I work a lot with uh, children with behavior disorders, and I actually really enjoy seeing the child in the home environment or within the context of the environment where the behaviors occur, so I can actually understand how to script an intervention to support that behavioral need. Um, also, when we think about trauma, informed service delivery. The RAND Corporation, if any of you are trained in CBITS, Cognitive Behavior Interventions for Trauma in Schools or Bounce Back, they are currently working on adapting those interventions for a telehealth model implementation. Um, and so they're currently working on that and doing some training around that. So there are ways to continue that evidence-based programming within that telehealth format. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah. Thank you, Susan. We have a few questions from our question and answer form. Um, Joyce, I'm going to go through them and maybe you can also help me as, uh, answer some of these. So the first one is, how do you deal with liability when working with special education students and confidentiality when parents want them um, with them during the meeting? So um, liability, let me just speak to liability and confidentiality. So part of running a telehealth clinic is, the confidentiality um, and consent must be completed prior to any services delivered. Um, with respect to having the parent, so that's like, sometimes it's between, a, I think, sometimes a clinical, also a clinical decision on, on whether, how appropriate it would be for a parent to participate in treatment. Um, I know in my practice, when, um, when my providers come and ask me about that, I always ask specifically, is that important to clinical goals, treatment goals? Um, number two, um, can we talk with the student and see if that would be appropriate or if they can invite their parent in? So I'm seeing it twofold, the clinical issue and the liability issue and a regular legal issue. Um, you wanna clear those legal things up prior to a session. And then if it's a clinical need that maybe that's something you could talk through your student client to include that parent in the sessions. Susan, did you wanna to add to any of that? Sounds that's good? excellent. Yeah, okay. and you know, I think a lot of us were thrown in uh, to, you know, we'd already gotten consent signed at the school mm -hmm. level. Now we're doing telehealth. So many of us had to go back and include telehealth in that, right. in that informed consent, which is uh, many of us were stuck in that place. NASW also developed a really good sample consent for telehealth, which is available on their website that you could easily adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, making sure that that's obtained in the next academic year, just in case whatever happens. Absolutely. Um, Very important to include that. Um, telehealth services delivery within the consent form. Second question, um, 
says, I am a licensed clinical social worker in Pennsylvania, and I'm wondering if group therapy is possible with elementary students worried about informed consent and confidentiality issues. Absolutely, we do do group, not with elementary, we're focusing right now on individual, but we do group settings with um, higher education students. So it's a, it's a possibility to do that. Um, again, focus first getting that informed consent, ensuring the confidential and privacy space. But yes, I think we haven't done it, but you can do a group setting, a group session on telehealth. Um, I hope I answered that one. Um, third question. So how can we support our families who relied on school district for technology support like laptops and hotspot buses? Um, when those services have now ended due to the end of the school year, how can we continue to provide our support over the summer when we can't at the school due to concerns with COVID-19 for face-to-face -face sessions? And this, Dr. Ellswick, is from a former student of yours. Ah, so that's great. I'm glad to have you on. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, and what I would say about, uh, basically you're talking about an infrastructure issue. Many of our students, there is a digital divide that still exists in, across the nation where lots of people don't have, have access to service delivery, uh, internet service delivery or access to technology. I think one of the things that we will have to do is really focus on helping to build that infrastructure. There are a, a number of grants currently right now available to develop infrastructure for schools um, and for programs to embed telehealth. The uh, SAMHSA actually has a number of grants currently available. Your state probably is looking at some specific grants that would help to build that uh, infrastructure in schools. Uh, there are a lot of schools that are one-to-one. -one. There are a lot that are not. Um, and so this will be one of those advocacy areas as a mental health practitioner in schools that we're going to have to advocate for. Um, but I think after this pandemic, uh, we're going to see a lot more advocacy around um, di the digital divide and digital inclusion. Okay, I'm going to take a couple more questions and then I'll move on. So the next question is, when is telehealth not appropriate to address trauma? Would you recommend a hybrid approach for those with PTSD? So in telehealth at my clinic, we um, see a number of clients to address trauma. Um, we actually use an evidence-based practice um, called Seeking Safety, which is geared specifically for trauma. Um, and I guess my follow-up question is, I guess, what are you concerned about um, not being able to do in a telehealth that you'd be doing in a face-to-face -face session? So um, I guess I need just a little more clarification on that. But so far, our work, um, we've been able to address uh, the trauma issues that we have come across. Um, and then, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that fully, but and the next question, is there an age at which telehealth is less, less effective? For example, kindergarten age. Um, my experience has been, well, specifically my clinic, we focus on the middle school, so 12 years and older in our clinic. I have heard some of my students who, um, because of the COVID crisis, having some challenges with a, like a kindergartner or or first grader probably, mostly with attention. Um, and um, I'm not saying I don't recommend it. You might see sessions might be a little shorter. You might see a parent being um, involved a little more. You might have to be really creative in what you're doing in the um, session. As you guys know, many of the, the students right now are getting their classroom work through telehealth. So they are getting experience with it. And it would be you know, up to you as the clinician to kind of figure out what that niche is for your student. How can you capture their attention and keep them, um, I guess, attending to what you're doing in the session um, for you know, limited amount of time. Susan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, we'll talk a little bit in a, uh, later in the slides yeah. about specific best practices, and I do serve infants all the way through 12th grade, and mm -hmm. it, there, you can serve young, young children, uh, but it does look different, just like Sarah was saying, you're going to have to adapt the length of your service, so you're going to have to be a little bit more engaging, a little bit more direct, but we'll go into some of those interventions later in, in the slides. Okay.
Great. So thank you. Um, and we'll be answering your questions as we go. So continue using the question and answer pod. And I'm going to start, um, I'm going to present um, what we do at USC Telehealth specifically with our school um, partnerships. And we're going to start talking a little bit about how to start a telehealth in, in schools. And let me just give you a little background. So um, we've been around, our telehealth clinic has been around since 2012. And um, we, we conducted outreach and engagement to let the community know about our services. And what we found was a lot of, we had done a presentation at Los Angeles County Office of Education. And we found that a lot of schools and charter schools were calling us and referring out their student, students to us for mental health services. When we saw this uptick, we decided as a team that maybe we should develop something um, since we see this huge need in the schools, as many of you know, that resources and services are limited in our schools. Um, and so we wanted to see how we can, you know, meet that gap, uh, fill that need for our schools. Um, so we developed what we call TeleSuite. Um, I'm going to backpedal just a little bit more and just tell you what the clinic looks like. So we are housed, um, we have head, physical headquarters in downtown LA. Um, our clinic is comprised of 25 uh, USC School of Social Work interns, both clinical and macro students. Um, and those students receive an eight week um, very rigorous training on psychosocial assessment, on evidence-based practices, on documentation, crisis intervention, um, and they are supervised by licensed clinical social workers who also have a dual appointment in our school as faculty. Um, and they handle the clinical portion of our clinic. Uh, we also have an operations portion um, and they're responsible for like scheduling and referrals and troubleshooting technology um, and billing and things like that. Um, and so that's about, uh, uh, we have what we call an outreach coordinator, a program manager, administrative assistant. We also have caseworkers who are MSW graduates from our school as well as the clinic who, pro who are providing services to our clients and they're collecting their hours toward licensure. So we as a team, um, we provide services uh, to, for residents um, in the whole state of California. Let me just add that our students come from all over the country. So we have students as far as New York, um, Oregon, Washington, um, all over, Midwest. And we also have students that are um, uh, coming to us internationally. They have, uh, they might be military uh, families and they are completing their internship hours at telehealth and they're providing the services to our California residents. So, um, oh, I, I kind of said this already, but yeah, they, they are getting uh, eight week rigorous training. They are, um, learning about motivational interviewing and problem solving therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and what we call seeking safety. Seeking safety is an evidence-based practice that's um, really geared to provide, um, well, to develop coping strategies specifically for those who are um, dealing with trauma and or um, clients that are using substances or alcohol to cope with their trauma. Our interns um, participate in weekly and individual groups, um, group supervision, and they are exposed to a variety of diagnoses from mild anxiety to bipolar. I just wanna reiterate something that Susan uh, mentioned. What we found in our practice is that some, um, that if you're outside of that mild to moderate arena, that sometimes uh, we found that the telehealth platform doesn't really work. For example, we've had um, clients who have history of auditory hallucinations, um, some psychosis, and um, that, you know, talking to a person through the computer um, just wasn't effective. Um, they were more easily distracted. Um, just, it just wasn't working for us for that particular um, 
uh, those individuals uh, experiencing those symptoms. So um, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, our, um, yeah, so that wasn't working for us. Um, we service um, everyone in California. So anyone who's heard about our services can access um, USC telehealth clinical services. Um, we don't ask for insurance. Uh, we don't ask for um, any documentation regarding um, uh, legal status. Um, that we do require uh, just an ID to just verify who they are. They are free services, um, and we can provide up to 12 sessions of, of free therapy and counseling. We can service, or we have service, middle and high school, college and graduate students. We have provided services for parents with children with special needs, um, victims of abuse and domestic violence transitional age youth, active military veterans and their families, foster youth, LGBTQ, and older adults. So you can see that our clientele is very diverse. Uh, it really kind of looks like California in itself. So we just, anyone who finds this service, um, uh, you know, easily accessible and, you know, um, that fits for their lifestyle can come and get services from us. Um, which now um, sets up what we have done with our, our local schools. So um, again, going back to what I said earlier, we found a need to um, provide services to students in school districts that may not have a social worker on campus or just don't have the resources to um, provide counseling for their students. So we reached out, I'm going to use the example of the charter school that we have in California, it's called Live for Learn, and they have about eight charter schools um, spread throughout Los Angeles County. And um, we met with them and they um, noticed a very high need for students that were, um, that need counseling for lots of issues, like I mentioned earlier, trauma, behavioral abuses, grief and loss. So um, we created these partnerships with the schools. Um, and basically what it is, is the school agrees to provide a private and secure space. The space has to have a computer, needs to have a webcam, high speed and high speed internet. It's a private room. Um, so it's like an office for some places. Um, and then we also would need to create a, an MOU, a partnership with them. Um, some of the schools um, require, or want to have uh, like a coll collaborative care. So if they're referring clients to us, they want to also be able to, um, you know, talk about what's going on, are the clients showing up? Um, so we also would receive a release of information from the child and the family so that we can discuss their cases with say their teachers or their case manager, whoever's referring from the school. Um, this has been, it sounds, um, I was just telling Susan that this is such an easy, um, I think an easy thing to do, but it could be challenging for a lot of schools to do, but it really just requires a computer, private space, and a webcam um, to access the services. Our telesuite also have um, somebody, like we call them the liaison, and the liaison is the one that kind of um, just ensures that the computer is working, that the um, internet's working, that the space is private and confidential, and they're the ones who kind of monitor the students coming in and out of the room to access the services. So some of our schools will keep like a sign-in sheet just to see who's coming in and who's coming out. They keep a schedule. Some of our schools have um, the telesuite um, at specific hours of the day. So at our Live for Learn school, uh, we started out just Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12 to 4 that we would have um, counseling services available to them. Um, and um, we saw that some of the schools would, would need more hours and we would just add the hours onto them. Um, and they would um, be able to access our services. Um, it, it has proven to be very, um, um, you know, very user friendly and um, very useful for the schools. Um, and the schools are, are, you know, know that they're getting 
good services and the um, clients are, you know, are able to access their services weekly. Um, appointments are um, scheduled the same day and the same week every, um, every, you know, every week. So the same day and same time every week so that the students are able to rely on that hour every week. With COVID, with COVID hitting, we had to flip that um, very quickly and figure out how to get our students to continue their services. Many of the students continued on their smartphones um, or used their um, laptops if the schools allowed them to have laptops when they went um, um, from school back home. Um, we can skip to the next slide now. Thank you. Yeah, so Telesuites provide that live face-to-face -face service between clinician and client. Um, and like I said, it's a connection between the school and the clinician and wherever they are in the country. Um, what's so nice about it is they can join their virtual therapy session from the privacy of their own home or the privacy of an office, let's say in a school. Um, next slide, please. So what we found, um, the positives to these telesuites is that it does improve access to mental health services, those much needed mental health services that many schools um, just don't have the resources for. Um, some students seek services on their own. I know some of our schools um, just post the flyer um, in a counseling office. If they don't want to access services, let's say at the school, they are free to do it at home too, which is also very nice. Um, it's safe. It's private. It's really easy to set up and a low cost. Many um, schools that we work with have computers just sitting around um, and not being used. And I found that across the board. Um, what the big challenge is, is space. I know many schools are um, just don't have enough space. Um, and some sites have set up like a, a supply closet, unfortunately. And they just clear it out and they put a desk in there, they put a light in there, and it's a private confidential space. Um, another challenge is the technology, um, having fast enough Wi-Fi, having a webcam, having speakers, um, having a microphone. Sometimes they don't, they might have the computer, but they don't have the, um, auditor, audit, uh, the audio or the visual. And then another significant um, barrier or challenge is that one person, the liaison that we talked about, um, to kind of man the telesuite. That's always kind of hard to delegate with resources um, so um, few in the schools. Uh, but we found that if you're able to provide the space, um, the computer, the technology, the staff, that this form or this um, option really works for our students. Um, let's see, do I have another slide? Oh, best practices in telehealth. So when, when, when the students at USC um, had to go telehealth, one of the biggest questions I got across the board from our students was, what do I do in a session, okay? And uh, in a telehealth session, it was a huge barrier. And I asked them, well, what do you do in a normal session? And they're like, we play games. I go, yeah, that's a good idea. Play games. What else do you do? You, you do some art. Um, you might talk, uh, but that might not work. I mean, when I think of working with children, I always think about play therapy. And there's lots of really um, good things. You kind of have to think outside the box and be really creative. I have found that a lot of the things that you can do in a face-to-face uh, -face session, you can really do um, in a in a virtual session um i think we oh here's some here's some ideas here so supporting our pre-k through 12 in a telehealth model so like we mentioned earlier your session length might have to be adjusted for those younger students and for, especially for the younger students you know talk therapy isn't going to work you really probably have to be prepared just like you would in the face-to-face -face of an activity that you can do online um, you want to utilize these play-based activities. Um, I think Susan has these wonderful ideas here, like scavenger hunts, wiggle games, expressive arts, um, 
let's see, uh, using, oh, practicing mindfulness um, and engaging parents. These are all things that you can do in a session. Um, in Zoom, which, we, which is what we use, um, in Zoom we can use a, a whiteboard um, to do some art therapy. Um, we also um, do games on therapy. I like to send out my students worksheets in advance so they can get it through email and we work it out in the session. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, Susan to come in. I'm not familiar with rapid assessment instruments, so maybe you can speak on that. Absolutely. So, you, you know, as we mentioned before with these best practices, you're, you're a talented clinician. You have great skill sets that doesn't change when you start using telehealth programming. And so one of the things we want to make sure we're using those evidence-based practice, but we're adapting it to that telehealth model. Um, and one of the things we have to continue is consistently track progress of our clients, in, even in our telehealth sessions. Um, so within my program, we have the ability to do rapid screening and assessment in every session. So if I'm working with a child individually and I may have given them at baseline or at the beginning of therapy a screening tool on depression or anxiety. I'm actually going to re-administer that screening tool by doing a screen share and having them fill out the inventory and I can immediately tell them in that session what the outcomes, you know, it looks like your depression is improving. How do you feel on a scale of zero to 10? Zero being no depression at all, 10 being intense depression in this moment, where are you? So consistently using those best practices across the board will help us to track whether or not the student's on target for meeting their goals and objectives. We we are going to provide a number of rapid assessment instruments that are what we call public domain or open instruments that you can use freely and make copies of. Um, I've been able to do within my telehealth uh, platform, uh, put them in an online format so the child can touch the screen or tell me which one to pick and then I can give them the results of that immediately on the screen as they're sharing that screen with me. Um, but you can do it where um, you're just asking them the questions in a telehealth uh, model, you know, so it doesn't necessarily be, mean that they have to see the inventory, but you can still ask those same questions to get an idea of where they are. Um, Somebody asked in the chat box, what do you do about making sure that other people aren't taking screenshots of the kid doing therapy or um, that, that there's not somebody else in the room with them? And I'll tell you from experience, um, just the other day, I was working with a kiddo and she was acting super strange in the session. She wasn't being as open as she typically is. And I sat there for a minute and I was like, is everything okay? Do you feel like you're in a safe enough place to have this conversation? And then all of a sudden I hear mom, oh, well, I'm sitting over here. I just wanted to see how sessions are going. And so I just stopped and I go, well, mom, come on in. Why don't you jump into the session for a second? And so instead of it making it to be like, oh, mom, you should never do that. I just engaged mom to be part of it for a moment. And then I let the kiddo go. And then I talked to the mom for a minute about the importance of the child having the ability to have confidential space and to be able to communicate with me. And then I would do a check-in with mom each week. And so my, my sessions have to be adjusted depending on the child's age. So I might tell the caregiver, I'm gonna work with kiddo for 30 minutes. And then the last 15 minutes, I'd love for you to jump on and we can kind of talk about how things are progressing or things that you need to, to ask me about or that you, so sometimes, clarifying to the caregiver what that is supposed to look like needs to happen consistently through therapy. <laughs> but I could tell just by the way that the, the student was acting that something was different in the environment. Um, and so sometimes we're going to have to navigate those issues as they pop up in practice uh, and just be prepared to, to answer those kinds of situations. Um, also making sure we're keeping the teachers uh, uh, updated. You know, Sarah even mentioned that you have to get a release of information because they're a host provider within this school district. So they have to get a release of information to be able to communicate back and forth between the teachers about needs that the student may have that could best benefit them. Um, but the teachers need to be updated too. Um, and so, you know, at making sure that we're, we're working within that multi-systemic model of practice in an effective way, even within that telehealth format. Um, one of the other questions that came up, Sarah, somebody had asked about um, how do you fund your program? How, how are you? And so I kind of mentioned that you use a contract service yes. delivery with the school. Do you want to speak to that for a minute? Specifically with the county. So we have two contracts, one with the LA County Department of Mental Health and one through Monterey Bay County. So any of the clients that access our services from those counties, the county, um, we, we are basically um, 
being reimbursed through the county for those services. We also have, if you don't fit either one of those um, counties, we have a pro bono that we offer, pro bono, I guess, program where those, the services are free. Um, so we don't bill insurance. Um, they are through a contract through the county. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple other questions here. Uh, so with telesuites, are the assigned time slot or can they access permission at any time, like a crisis hotline? No. So one of the things in the informed consent specifically states it, uh, is that telehealth does not pri provide crisis um, intervention or, cri or outside of services outside the normal business hours. So that's also a reason why we focus on the mild to moderate um, diagnoses or symptoms. But um, if, for example, you know, sometimes our students might be experiencing crisis, we do um, offer them um, emergency um, numbers in, in those events on how to access those services in the event that they are experiencing a crisis outside business hours or not during their session or whatever that is, they are given those emergency numbers to access it. That's one of the things that we clearly state in our consent form. Um, and then another question for Sarah, are wait lists, wait times a challenge in telehealth services with your program? Yes. Um, prior to COVID, we had a probably two week to three week waiting list with COVID. Unfortunately, we're at like a six to eight week right now. Um, and um, because you know, because our time is time limited, it's um, about 12, like I said, 12 sessions um, for our, our, our telebehavioral health services. Um, we just have to kind of wait that out. So we, um, our admin, um, our admin um, workers are, you know, directed to call those clients that have been waiting a while to see if they're still available and we offer them services if they need services if they don't want to wait any longer but we do have a wait list right now um let's see and i'm answering some of these uh mm -hmm. questions directly in the question and answer okay. uh, there's some really great questions there's though. a lot of great questions uh, so there's one for you the rai is this tool low cost or a free tool so all the ones that we're gonna share with you are completely free. There is no cost to them. Many of them are free rapid screening tools that are provided by SAMHSA. Um, the ones that I'm gonna share with you are more appropriate for children and adolescents. Um, they include assessments such as like the scared for anxiety, which helps to break down, is it social anxiety? Is it anxiety around uh, specific events or, or specific needs? Um, so it even helps you to establish what level of anxiety the child has. So they are all free. You can duplicate those, you can print them out. Uh, and reuse them. So they're all free tools. And we'll make sure we have that list available to you on our website. Mm -hmm. Another free tool that we use at telehealth, we use the PHQ-9 and the GAG-7, both at the beginning and at the end of sessions. Um, other things that we do, we do guided imagery exercising and role play. Those are always, those are also very good to do on telehealth. One thing I started using with my younger kids, well, like the 12 year olds, is video and reflection. So I found this, I found TED Talks. I just love TED Talks. I found TED Talks for younger kids. Um, and you can play a video um, for, for your kiddos. And you know, they're, they're short because they're made for kids. And we just do a reflection. We talk about what we saw. Uh, we talk about how we can apply it through, you know, in their own life and what they learn and what they take from it. So um, that one I saw and I, I, like, I wanted to share that with you because that's fairly new. And I mentioned the whiteboard activity. So like Zoom has um, a whiteboard capacity. And for my students that are new to telehealth, I always start off with a really easy paper and pencil game. We do tic-tac-toe or we do hangman, we just play so that I kind of engage them early on so they know it's not just both of us looking at each other during a session. We're actually going to do interactive, experiential stuff to introduce and engage them in that first session. Um, another thing I didn't mention on here, but we I do, um, what I love to do, and I'd like to do this in face-to-face -face session, was doing collages with my older kids. And how I do that is I use the whiteboard. And we'll just do, and you can do this, you know, through your, through the Zoom platform, if that's what you're using. And we just go through Google and we start looking at pictures that they like, and I start cutting and pasting. And we have this um, 
virtual collage that we've made together in session. That's one of my favorite things to do in session. And it's really easy to use. Once you become really familiar with the platform and the capacities it has, you can get really creative. These are just some of the things that, um, you know, through trial and error, I have found worked out really well in, in tele, um, in telehealth and that, you know, sometimes you have to take that risk and just try something. It might not work all the time, but trying to figure out what, what your kid likes again um, and going back to their own strengths and what they like to do. And how can you creatively incorporate that into a telehealth session? Exactly. Um, yeah. Did you want to add to that, Susan? So no, I just, you're oh. so, I think people are so nervous about it. That yes. But it really is very similar to face-to-face -face. once you get comfortable with whatever platform you're using. You know, somebody asked about how to do groups. Zoom offers a beautiful breakout opportunity in, in Zoom where maybe you want them to talk in small groups about a specific topic. And so you can break them out into small breakout sessions and they can be talking. You can jump in and jump out of the session and really navigate that group in a beautiful way. Uh, mm -hmm. And as Sarah was mentioning, you're going to be doing a lot of directive kind of activities in a group. So I might tell them next week, we're going to be doing an art activity where we're going to be sharing together. Please make sure to have a pencil, pen, paper with you next time. And then I'll just prompt them again at the beginning of the group session. Groups can be done beautifully in telehealth. I would say making sure you don't uh, overdo it, really no more than six. I would yeah. really kind of keep it to six or less when I'm doing yeah. a telehealth group. Um, and so that can kind of help you to navigate some of the problems around group-based practice in telehealth programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, six is a, that's a, that's a bigger group than I would say, but six, that could, that could work. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, I think that, yeah, so just question and answers now. We've been kind of answering some as we go. I'm just taking a look at it now. Um, uh, one of the questions is how many clients oh. would you recommend seeing via telehealth, um, like caseload wise? Like what okay. would you suggest, Sarah? How do your how do your clinicians in your clinic manage caseload? Okay, so that's a good question. So most of my clinicians are uh, part time, so about twenty to twenty four hours a week, and the max caseload that they can carry is uh, twelve. So that's about half of their time. Um, and that leaves room for documentation, uh, group and individual supervision, um, and any other training that might be available to them. So that's, that's manageable. Um, just as a, a data point, um, we track our no-show rate, and our no-show rate on telehealth is about 30%. It's got as low as 25 uh, in some semesters. So um, it's a little better than that 50% no-show rate, which some clinics, face-to-face -face clinics have. So it is only about 30%. So we do have a pretty good show rate, a little better than average, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, I would say 10 to 12 if you're working part-time. Mm -hmm. Let's see, the next question, would you need a release to teachers if you work in the schools as an employee? Um, I've been interested in how much to share and with whom. Do you have a, okay. So when you're thinking about school-based practice, this, this is also a concern when you're faced in the school setting, like who do I share what with, right? Teachers need information that's going to benefit the child within the school setting. So like I'm going to give the teacher tips and I might have talked to the kid about something trauma based in our session. I'm not going to go tell the teacher that. Instead, I might tell the teacher, it looks like Johnny really struggles with communicating in the class, right? He really struggles with feeling confident, raising his hand and asking for assistance. So even though that may be a symptom of some of the trauma experiences he's had, I'm not going to disclose the specific trauma, but I am going to tell the teacher tips and techniques and effective intervention that they can utilize within their classroom to enhance outcomes for the child, both academically and behaviorally. So um, we, Sarah's program is similar to, to the program that I run where we are host providers. We are not directly school personnel. So, uh, and, and even in your school, you need to get a release of information to discuss information specifically with the teacher. That is just best practice. Um, and you're not going to go into the details about what you're covering in sessions. I have a lot of teachers that are like, I saw you pull Johnny. What did y'all talk about this week? And I just have to go, you know what? We're providing supportive services and there'll be things that I'll give you that are going to benefit your relationship with him. And I'll give you some tips and techniques. So sometimes teachers want 
then it's not always that they're trying to be nosy. It's that they want to know what can I do to support this kid more in the classroom. And so we have to be very conscious that within that multi-systemic model, the teachers are part of that equation and they have to be part of the solution. And so just making sure that your releases are uh, in place uh, for discussing things with specific teachers, uh, with special ed teachers, if the special ed teacher is involved with administration. And so usually I get a, a global consent that says I have the ability to communicate with the teacher, the administration, like anybody that's in the kid's life that I think I will need to communicate with, that's what I write into my release um, and have the caregiver sign it so that they understand what the purpose of me talking to the teacher is uh, as it relates to that counseling and therapy. Okay, great. Uh, another question, what platform do we use? We use Zoom for healthcare. Um, so it has a extra level of security. It can't be hacked. Um, that's one thing you want to make sure you use. Um, like uh, Susan mentioned earlier, so some of the rules have been a little lax, not lax, but just a little freer with, re um, with regard to um, what platforms they're using right now during the pandemic. I'm sure in the future that's going to tighten up a little bit. So you want to make sure that you use something that um, is HIPAA compliant if you go forward with this. We mentioned some really good platforms at the beginning of um, the session and it's they're listed on the PowerPoint which will be uploaded onto the website at, um, after the um, webinar. Um, do you have any suggestions for ways to connect with new clients when conducting intakes virtually? It's, it's different from moving your in-person clients to using a virtual uh, platform. Um, suggestions to connect with new clients. So um, I, would, I would make the connection. So in that first session, if you're doing intakes, that um, you know they're sizing everything up with this first session so you got to make sure <laughs> that you're having really good eye contact that the technology is working really well um, sometimes when um, we do some of those outcome measures i prepare the session and i have the questions in the chat box ready so that they can look at it versus me asking them to repeat repeat um, things um, but um, i think having really good Good. getting back to basics, being very attentive, starting where they're at, um, being prepared for the session, um, and knowing what you like. This question comes up a lot with my clinicians. Should I handwrite my notes or should I type right on the computer while they're doing their intake? When That comes up a lot. And I'm going to say that's your preference. you got to figure out what works well for you. Are you a paper or pencil person? Because again, that first session, you want to be really as confident and as comfortable as you can in that first session during that intake to convey to your new client um, the comfort that you can have or the comfort and safety you can provide in that first session. That's great. Mm -hmm. well, you know, and there's a couple of questions about can we share sample releases. I'm fine with sharing just kind of a broad sample release of what you can use in practice. We'll post that on our website so you can have access to that. Um, and you, we're, we're about to be up yes. for time. This was a great webinar, guys. You had such great questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're going to do, you will get a link after this, this webinar is com uh, completed that will go to your email that you provided, where we're going to ask some uh, survey questions about what, what topics would you like for us to cover. So maybe we didn't get to everything that you wanted to talk about today in relation to telehealth in schools. We would love to host another webinar. So give us your ideas or suggestions on where to go to next or the specific burning questions you have and we will try to see if we can set up another webinar specifically around this topic because I believe uh, it's going to continue to be a large topic just because of what we're going through nationally um, and so we want to be able to, to better support you through that um, but we want to thank you all again today Sarah thank you for your participation thank you thank just, you for you know inviting me I was honored to be here thank you um, and it's so good to hear about other programs and what's going on across the nation so mm -hmm. Again, we just thank everybody for attending. Please watch your email for the survey link. Uh, and we hope to see you again in, in a webinar in the near Good future. Luck. Good luck starting your telehealth.